We're delighted to welcome to Word in Your Attic, um, friend of the pod, world authority on the Beatles, Mr. Mark Lewison. Lovely to see you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Very the thing. world authority, the leading world authority, oh, come indisputably. On. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about that. I'm sure I'm going to meet someone someday. <laughs> you must, yeah, you must really dread meeting somebody who claims to be an authority. No, I, I, I know loads of people who know, in particular ways, know things more than I do. And I, I use them, which is great. I mean, we're friends and they help me. So, right, right, right. Yeah. No now, Mark, you, you got a, you, something we, came up yesterday when we... We recorded a, a Word in Your Attic yesterday with the great Jim Irvin, songwriter and yes. uh, journalist. And he came up with a story which w w we were going to ask you, actually, and you can maybe scotch this rumour once and for all, but it's such a good story. In 1954, uh, um, Mo Best, um, Mona Best, Mona Pete Best. Best's mum... Uh-huh put a large sum of money on a 33 to one horse called Never Say Die yeah, in the Derby. Yeah. And that the horse supposedly won and with the vast amount of money that she made from this horse race, Lester Piggott, age, age 18, interestingly, was the, was the jockey. With the money, a few years later, she bought what became the Casbah. And so therefore, that, if that was true, it's a very significant yeah. um, moment in the development of the story of the Beatles. But is it true? Because yeah. I don't think it appears in your uh, tune in book. Is it not in there? I can't. I don't think so. It. No. Um, um, is it not in the full edition? I'll have to check myself. Ah, ah, no, well, ah. I've only got the. Uh, I've only got the, the, the abridged one. Can, I've only got the one that uh, you know where Ringo appears on page three hundred and and uh, and the Beatles. <laughs> the first they get called the Beatles on page seven hundred. <laughs> that, that is the mere pamphlet. That one. <laughs> um, the best say that is true. They say that is their story. That's how we know it because it's they. It's the story that they told us. Right. Uh, so it's it's very hard to say that it isn't true, and it would be disrespectful to say it isn't true because they say it is. And who are we, etc. But <laughs> I think she bought the house in fifty eight, uh, and the horse won in fifty four. Fifty four. Uh, and by various accounts, and indeed from the, the virtue of the story you just told me, she was someone who liked to gamble. So not many gamblers hang on to their winnings for four years well, that's true. and invest them in a house. <laughs> Mostly it goes back on the next race. Right? So um, but I just throw that in, but I'm not going to actually challenge it. I, how do I, I wasn't even born at that point. How do I? <laughs> Very fair, very I, I, diplomatic. I was in touch with Mark ages, ago, ages and ages ago, but I can't even remember what the story was about something and uh, what appeared to be a nice little thread of a story about about th the day john lennon's father turned up at his door was also the day that they did some tv program i you may you probably don't remember mark i was in touch with you about this and and we got every little bit of it to line up apart from some of it yeah. and then mark, mark said to me welcome to my world yeah <laughs> that, that, that's clearly what, what what's involved in being the kind of boswell to the beatles you see yeah. is always trying to find bits that look as if they're going to line up perfectly and then just mm -hmm. you look too far and you find something that makes it untrue is that is that the case Kind of, yeah. I, I always liken my job to finding as many. I mean, you've got uh, Mark Billingham doing his Beatle jigsaw puzzles, right? I watched him do one with you the other day. Well, I'm doing that with all the, the real stuff, the real lives. Uh, and not everything fits neatly together. Yeah. Because life isn't like that. And especially when you're relying on memories um, of people whose retelling of something has slightly misshapen it. There's some new Beatles, some new old Beatles stuff that surfaced recently, hasn't there? Uh, there was that fantastic photograph that came up a couple of weeks ago of John, Paul and George in 1959 um, rehearsing in a house, having a bit of a thrash by the look of it, as teenagers do. And that, I mean, there aren't that many photographs of the Beatles in their really early days. Uh, there are a few. And so suddenly to get another one was a great thrill and it's got it's dark and it's hard to make out all the detail but it's history is in that picture and it is alive with history so i think i said it was like history lives in emily every dimly lit detail mm. it's a bit like that you know it's murky and yet it's so strong you can date that picture 
I, I think to some extent by the fact that there was one in 1958, very famous picture that anybody watching this would remember. It's by Mike McCartney, I think, of the, of the three boys with a guy called Dennis Littler, I think. You know the one in his house? It's a, the first colour picture of the Beatles. It's a, and it's a and the interesting thing about that... For another four years, yeah, it's really... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and George is not full grown, as it were. George is still much shorter than them. Whereas this picture you're talking about came out a year later and he's kind of the same height as the other two. Yeah, he, mu he must have had a real growing spurt between 1958 yeah. and between 15 and 16 because, yeah, he's a, he's a boy in the first picture. He's, he's a month beyond 15 in the first picture. And here he's all of 16 and a half and there's a big difference. He's pretty much their height. Um, but it's, you can date it also because John is playing the guitar with the money that he got from working on a building site in, when he did a summer of laboring in 1959 in order to have the money to pay off the weekly repayments on a, a Club 40 guitar, on a Club 40 guitar. Um, Club footy, as they called it. <laughs> George, already Not that kind of detail. <laughs> George already had one and then John got one as well. And uh, so John is playing his club footy, but George isn't playing his future armour, which was his um, Fender-like guitar that he got when he got his first job working in a department store in about October 59, November 59. So it's right in the middle between, it's probably around September 59. Mm. And the best say that it's their house. And again, you know, if that's what they say, that's what they say. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great to be able to date it from little clues that you can get from what right. guitar they're playing and what's in the background and all of that. It's detective work. Mm. So, so where, does, where does a picture like that come from? Is it possible to, to say where it comes from? I don't know who took it, um, and, but it, it, it surfaced through uh, a Beatles, a rock music memorabilia dealer called Trax, based in the north of England. They're continually out there looking for stuff to buy and sell. And this came in, I think, on a contact sheet. Um, and I was in their office a couple right. of years ago and saw it. I mean, what the hell is that picture there? And they scanned it and it looks beautiful. So there are presumably other pictures that you've seen that, that we haven't yet seen that are still, yeah. you know, haven't been out in the public. Yes, I think so. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, there's tracks I, that I you've heard. Stuff. There's yeah. tracks. There's, I mean, you're one of the very few people who's heard Carnival of Light, the, the track that they recorded in January yeah. 1967 for that event yeah. at the Roundhouse, you know. And anybody who hasn't heard it, I mean, I suspect it probably isn't very good or it wouldn't be out by now, but anyone who hasn't heard it is thrilled by the idea that there's a 15 or 16 minute Beatle track that we've never actually uh, uh, you know, been yeah, exposed to. It's one of those which when we have heard it, when people have heard it, they'll stop being so interested in it. But <laughs> it, it remains tantalising and, that, and that's the point about it. It's, it's okay. Um, I have heard it a couple of times. I heard it again during the anthology production period. Um, Paul wanted it on Anthology, what would it have been, Anthology 2? I think it was Anthology 2 that covered that period. I can't remember. Two or three. Uh, and it got vetoed. It got vetoed by at least one of the other board members of Apple. And so it didn't make it. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Again, they needed unanimity of decision. Yeah. Um, yeah. Paul wanted it on to show how he was the avant-garde Beatle first. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Um, and the others didn't want it on, probably for the same reason. <laughs> 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 yeah, you you were you were talking about the the famous old line about top of most of the popper most, which is apocryphal tales about. Yeah, well, it turns out that it's not so apocryphal. You know, we we just had the fiftieth anniversary of the breakup, uh, or the the announcement of the breakup. Um, and it, it occurred to me that 10 years earlier, exactly in 1960, they had this chant, the Beatles had this chant, John Paul and George and probably then Stuart and Pete had this chant when things weren't going well, which in their world wasn't very often because mostly it was an upward trajectory, but nonetheless, sometimes you know, they would have a bad night or the gig would, you know, didn't work properly or the amps broke or whatever. They had this chant and John would say, where are we going, fellas? And the others in an American accent. And the others would say, to the top, Johnny. Uh, to the, and what was get the exact wording right? Um, Where's that, fellas? To the topper most of the popper most, Johnny. <laughs> and that was their 
rallying call in when times were bad to kind of yes you know we're still here we're still together a lot of irony in it as well it was kind of done in a heavy american accent as a sender um and when i was writing tune in i was reading every music paper every page of every music paper for every week beginning in about 1954 because i just wanted to trace the evolution somebody has to <laughs> well <laughs> The phenomenal riches of British music papers uh, yeah. from from 1920 something when Melody Maker started through late 40s when the NME started they are incredible all of them not people there's a tendency to go that it was all about the enemy or Melody Maker well yes no, but yeah, yeah. don't discount disc and music echo don't discount yeah. Mirror, don't discount yeah. sounds any of those so I'm reading just you, don't, you never know what's on every page. And as I get to, I think it was um, July 1960, looking at my notes here, July 1960, was it? Yeah. There was a piece in the NME, a news piece, that said the Top Rank Records, remember when Top Rank had a record label? Top Rank Yeah, Records, I do. Yeah, they introduced an LP series next week that will be called Toppermost. And it's coinciding with their current advertising slogan, Toppermost of the Poppermost. There you I go. read this and thought, they got it from somewhere. They saw that. They must have seen that in either the NME or Record Mirror or Disc, Record and Show Mirror, as it was then. Um, and they've taken it from there. They've obviously thought, how, fu how stupid that is. How stupid is, is one of those phrases that someone, an older person who doesn't understand teenagers, comes up with a slogan that they think is going to be the hip slogan of the month. Toppermost of the poppermost. You can and, just... and didn't they suggest also the best place to buy it is the shoppermost as well yes. in one yes. of the ads that you found? Yeah. That's right, yeah. And maybe you're showing them on screen. I would be showing you things now. I'd be holding up things. Um, but uh, I moved house last year and most of my stuff is still in storage so i don't actually have anything and there was one toppermost album and it was by dion and the belmonts here it is <laughs> my insert album. sleeve here yeah. <laughs> toppermost and um i bought it on ebay as soon as i saw that i went online found that there was one album called toppermost and bought it on ebay bought about three copies of it and it's, you can still get it quite inexpensively mm. there aren't that many copies around Dion on the Belmonts doing American standards is what it is and um, but no sooner had top rank launched that uh, toppermost of the poppermost than the label fell apart and got it went bankrupt basically and got picked up by EMI EMI picked up the ruins of right. it. And that became the basis of the stateside label. The really I'm going to say, yes, because I'm sure I haven't got a Gary U.S. Bond record on top rank. Would that, yeah. be, would that make sense? I think it yes. would. Yes, 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 absolutely it would, yeah, yeah. So um, there was this thing called the Rank Cooperative. I'm fascinated with the music business. Rank Cooperative was a, a combination of American independent record labels, all the little labels all around the USA that did all the hot R&B and all of that. That they were released in England through Rank. Well, Joseph Lockwood of EMI picked up the remnants of Rank, including right. the cooperative, and that is why EMI launched a record label called Stateside. Right. The Stateside had the early Tamla on it, yep. um, also VJ and Swan Records and Laurie Records. The Beatles' own records in America were released on VJ first and then Swan. These were companies that EMI had a relationship with right because of the rank thing that they had picked up but working at rank at the very time when this toppermost of the poppermost slogan is invented was dick rowe ah. dick rowe had left decker to join rank and when rank fell apart he went back to decker and he is the man who is credited with the rejection of the beatles guitar groups are on the way out and that rejection for the Beatles was one of the times when they would have said, where are we going, fellas? To the top, Johnny. Yeah. Where's that, fellas? The top of most of the pop of most, Johnny. And they would have had no idea that that phrase was actually coined by the man who had just rejected them. <laughs> it's just absolute. Fantastic. They would have had no idea of the origin of that phrase beyond the fact they may have read it somewhere but not actually who came up with it. And it was Dick Rowe. 
Can I interject very quickly with a record, weirdly, that I've found upstairs <laughs> in the roof, which oh, yeah. was, I don't know if you've ever seen this, this is on VJ Records that you were talking about, which is absolutely amazing. Right. I don't know if you've ever seen this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, of course you've seen it. You've got a copy, haven't you? <laughs> I, I, do, I do, yes. It says on the cover, George talks about the Paddy Boyd. That, absolutely. George talks about the Paddy Boyd. Absolutely. John, why John gives out the addresses of the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Is Paul really married? Uh, <laughs> is John having another baby? It's yeah. absolutely fair. Ringo tells us about his throat operation. I just get, it gives you some idea of just the extent of interest, doesn't it? Yeah, it claims to be claims to be an EMI recording. But, uh, I, no, I, no, I, it was actually, it was VJ. It was VJ. Yeah. It was, well, it, it, VJ did a deal with a couple of uh, DJs, DJs, VJ, DJ. Uh, in America, just to get their tapes of the Beatles on their US tour in August '64. Yeah. To the um, absolute consternation of Brian Epstein, I've seen some correspondence in which he was furious about that album. And so can't blame him. Records, yeah. Because it was all unofficial. I mean, the, yeah. uh, the guy who the guys who did the recordings had no right to to sell the tapes like that. But, you know, that's the way it was. America was like the Wild West in 64 when the Beatles broke through. It was like the Wild West. I mean, it was just like, it was so hardly commercial, so harshly commercial there compared to anywhere else in the world. That as soon as the Beatles set foot first time, and particularly the second time, there was just this kind of gold rush towards them. Everyone yeah. would zoom yeah. on them. And there was this whole legacy of, of spurious releases and dodgy merchandise and people doing sorts of things. You know, they, unlicensed so they could try and get away with it was fantastic and i'm piecing it all back together again to look at how what that tells us about the corporate world in 1964 and how the beatles just went turned everything upside down so mm. so you're working on the second volume of your of your uh, three part series you were and the yeah. first one ended at uh, i think new year's eve 1962 when they made a, a single of yet to make an album Can where I do you think the second one is going to end have you got any idea yet what what the, what the kind of parameters are it's, it's definitely 1966 it's probably the end of the year i'm still i'm still waiting for it to tell me but i think it'll be the end of the year because then that'll be a nice symmetry It'll be, the first book ends New Year's Eve 62, the second one will be New Year's Eve 66, and the third one New Year's Eve 70, because it was on that date that Paul filed his, uh, his lawsuit for the dissolution of the mm. Beatles partnership, or for the, the appointment of a receiver to their affairs. So, yeah. It must be so hard to, 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 to work out when, when to stop and to publish it, because you must be haunted by the idea if you don't keep researching some particular stream, you might, not, you might discover some incredible nugget of information. I, I say this all the time, but the research never ends. And, uh, you know, I mean, even when I'm, no, no matter what aspect the project is in, no matter whether I'm writing it or proofing it, there's still new stuff coming in. And there is new stuff about the first period that I found after publication of Tune In. I mean, it's inevitable. So, um, yeah, but I, I just have to draw the line at some point and say, this is what I need to write the book with and acknowledge that there will always be a little bit more and I can't get it in at least until there's a revision, maybe someday. Maybe. So when your publisher asks, when is volume two going to be in their hands what do you say to them do you say quit bothering me <laughs> or, do you, or do you have something you say to them i'm in the remarkable position of them not really bothering me anymore i mean this project is now it's it's now 16 years since i signed my contract and uh, <laughs> not many publishers um it's not that they they've forgotten about me because they they want my books but they, I'm, I don't think I'm on their, you know, this year list now at the moment. Right. Kind of, I'm just kind of somewhere on the back page coming in the future will be Mark Lewiston's volume two. So they, they, they're really great. I mean, if they were pressurizing me, it wouldn't help because I can't work on it any harder than I am. No, I'm sure. So I, and, I'm, and I do need to get on with it. I mean, I have the ultimate incentive in that I, you know, I'm not getting any more money until I deliver the next book. And life is expensive. Of course. That was why I did my theatre tour last year, just to kind of keep the money coming in just so I can carry on writing. You know, right. Which both Dave and I saw. It was absolutely magnificent. Fantastic. Oh, my goodness. I mean, the, the, the stuff about what you discovered about Mean Mr. Mustard. He was a real <laughs> character. Tell us about yeah. me, Mr. Buzz. He was sued by his own wife by, for his 
parsimony. Is that, what's the word? Yes. yes exactly. Parsimoniousness. Parsimoniousness. Yes. He's so parsimonious. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, John said in an interview that he got the mustard story from a newspaper piece. And in the days before you could e easily word search in newspapers, I just started to go back through newspapers. Looking for any mention of them. Yeah, mustard. looking for anything that he might have seen. I knew that he wrote it in India, so I naturally started looking in just before they went to India, February 16th, right, okay. backwards from there. Uh, and was surprised that uh, it turned up in June 67. Uh, and it was a court case, um, and he was being sued for divorce. It was in the divorce court, and it was a good story for Fleet Street. So in a way that they wouldn't usually cover regular humdrum divorces, here was a story. The story being he was so mean, that he made his wife uh, listen to the radio in the dark um, because there was nothing to see, why bother putting the lights on? And he shaved in the dark as well, which is the line that John took <laughs> song and all of that. So um, when I was doing the show last year, I just thought, well, there might be something here. And I just started to dig into that man's life, John Alexander Mustard, mean Mr. Mustard, and worked it all the way back to his birth in Scotland, in Scotland in 1902. Uh, where the Beatles had played in Elgin uh, just uh, in 1963. So, uh, and I just looked at it going forward, found the house, which was in Enfield in North London. Yeah, it's not far from where I am. Yeah. And at one point I was thinking of having Kevin Eldon uh, act in a little sketch there, playing me, Mr. Mustard, shot in that house and in that bathroom. And I, <laughs> I wrote to the occupants of the house and they didn't reply. So. Oh dear. Yeah. There should be a plaque on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, they probably noticed a load of people going and taking a picture. Sure. Um, yeah. so I know. I know people who've done this. I know people. No, really. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, they. Uh, no, it's so funny because we went to the kind of you were doing a run through of it in in Bloomsbury, and and the measure of it was that when I came out I was, afterwards. I was standing outside with Mark. I think Paul Denoy was there. I think Richard Williams was there. And everybody was saying, I didn't know that. Uh, Did you know that? I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> you had a room full of kind of real deep end Beatle fans and they'd still gone, I just, I, that was new well, to me. There's always something to know. And the thing is, even if, even if it has nothing you don't, that is, that is totally new to you, the very act of integrating knowledge a bit from here and a bit from there and a bit from here that is absolutely right and you slot it together yeah. when you see a picture and and hear a story that uh is greater than the sum of its parts in a way you yeah no definitely yeah way, but then you see it differently when it's brought together and that's yeah. that's all i'm doing with my you had the real words to sun king i can remember the kind of faux spanish words it was absolutely yeah. brilliant give yeah. us some examples of those phrases um, the, the big one was cake and eat it. That's um, it. <laughs> cake and eat it. Yeah, it was a lovely one. And we all I thought it was Spanish or something at the time. Yeah, yeah. Paul came up with most of that because he did Spanish at school. So he had a bit of, but it's not all Spanish. And cake and eat it is just a nicely made up word, you know. So, so are you going to be doing any more, um, you know, live events? Who, well, who knows? I mean, first of all, I've got a book to write. Uh, so I, I only um, I only did it to to aid the funding of the book. So sure. until I need more, I won't do it. But if I was doing it this year, it wouldn't be happening because you know everything's off. No, of course. of course. How can one make plans at the moment? You know, what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Look, there was yeah. something more about Topamosa I wanted to say. Well, oh, go on, no, right, go on. Just to come back to it. Um, so it occurred to me with the tenth and the fiftieth anniversary of the breakup, that the Beatles are quite clearly. Uh, beyond beating now they are the ultimate band they, they, they are their, their position is unassailable at the very top and it occurred to me that this phrase that they had the toppermost and the poppermost is exactly what they are if you had to say what are the what is their position they are now 50 years after their breakup still they are the toppermost of the poppermost so um, in readiness for this uh, in your attic uh, video cast. Uh, I've had a hat made. <laughs> oh, superb! I would wear, and it seems to be a good name for a hat as well. <laughs> and um, I've had a second one made as well. And I thought we could do a competition. Oh right, go on. Uh, the, you'll have to judge it and all of that. But right, 
Um, Toppermost of the Poppermost was a chant that the Beatles used to have in their van when things weren't going well. What other bands had something that would galvanize them when they were feeling low or that would make them laugh if they were in need of a laugh on the road in the middle of the night somewhere? Right. Other bands must have had something. And I thought if people, if you can find out what they are or people can send in their knowledge of that. Suggestions. Suggestions, or even make, make them up. I mean, what would other bands, uh, <laughs> places have been if they had had one? Uh, then I'll send the other one I've got to the, to the best. Kind of a, a, a nearly unique top and most hat. Yes, almost. Yeah, very close. Absolutely. Uh, it will be unique when I lose this one. <laughs> I know it's been very long. I always lose them somewhere. <laughs> well, we'll do that. We'll throw that hope open to the word in your attic. Massive. Yes. I mean, what would the Stones uh, chant have been if they? I can't had? imagine. Maybe that. they did have Maybe they did. Yeah. I, what trying. was the lowest point in the the, the, the Beatles? In, there's a bit in Tune In where they come back from Hamburg for the first time, which is so moving. And George has been sent home because he's underage. And they tried to leave the the, uh, the club to go to the top ten, and, and they're shocked. Aren't they? He's shocked for being underage. Yeah, yeah, Paul shocked. and Paul and Peter sent home for supposedly setting fire to the bedroom, and eventually John limps back two weeks later. And when they come back, they don't even tell each other they've they've come back. The Beatles basically hardly exists. Yeah, all the bands in Liverpool have kind of shot ahead in the last two months, and they're they're, they're about to break up. Yes, yeah, and they're, they're really not known in Liverpool at this point because they've gone off to Hamburg without even being known back home. Which is why when they returned and started to play again and they were billed as the Beatles from Hamburg, kids thought they were German. Not yeah. only because of the billing, but because they'd never heard of them before, even though mm. they were from their own city, because they were that unknown before they left. Um, but that was, that was, there was a, the key quote is from John Lennon where he says, you know, I had to think, do I want to carry on with this or don't I? Uh, and I think it was his aunt Mimi getting on his nerves about going out to get a proper job that probably forced him was part of the reason why he went, he carried on with the band and they picked it up again. And that was the moment when it just flew. Mm. They had all that Hamburg experience, you know, so it was dramatic. Um, yeah, George, George was sent home um, for being underage. He came overland by train and ferry and then train and so on. Um, in the meantime, Paul and Pete were deported and flown home. So George arrives back in Liverpool forlorn and immediately under pressure from his parents to get a job because he had thrown up an apprenticeship to go to Hamburg uh, or to go to Scotland and then Hamburg. Um, and he's amazed to find that Paul and Pete are actually home first. They're a home <laughs> ahead of him. He didn't even know they were being kicked out. Uh, and then John eventually comes home. Stuart stays and comes a bit later and they pick it up again and they play that famous date at Litherland Town Hall. Uh, December 2760. Actually, the date that John gets home from Hamburg at three in the morning with his cowboy boots and his guitar, he's got his new Rickenbacker uh, and has to throw stones up at Mimi's window to wake her up to let him in, is the 8th of December 1960. Uh, Ten years later, the 8th of December 1970, he did the interview with the arm winner for Rolling Stone, the interview. And 10 years later, the 8th of December, 1980, he was murdered. So, so the 8th of December, I don't know if I said that right, the 8th of December, three times. 60, a significant 70, day. 80, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Good. And that's why I put it in tune in that he got back on the 8th of December. But I didn't elaborate on that. It was just there for those who would pick up on it and for those who don't. Who don't. Okay. Well, during this period of lockdown, I have to confess, I've never read the long version of Tune In, Mark. Oh. And I, I, I read the, the lightweight, you know, stick it in your back pocket, paperback, <laughs> uh, you know, take it, on the, take it on the bus. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think this might be the time. I think, I think I'm sure that would apply to many people out there. It's while the, wa while waiting for the second volume, you, you might, as well, might you, as well. <laughs> you might as well. You might as well. Consider breath baited. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is such a lot in it. I mean, there is it is such a rich story. It's so full of interesting detail, and it's the the Beatles story is the very best story ever. Ever. I mean, how ridiculous that the chant that they had when they were rejected was written by the guy who rejected them, and they didn't know it. 
I mean, how, how ridiculous is that? And as the researcher, I just find all these strands and they always slot together like that, always, every time. I, I, and if you were doing the same thing about the Rolling Stones, it wouldn't be the same. You wouldn't find those kind of connections. You just wouldn't. You wouldn't. The Stone story is a brilliant story as well, but it is not, it doesn't have... It doesn't have it, that. It doesn't have the complexity of the Beatles story and the beauty of the Beatles story. The Beatles story is a, is a deeply beautiful story. I mean, I've, I'm, it's quite an emotional thing for me to research it so deeply because um, it has the best of humanity in it, I think, the Beatles story. I was watching, I've been doing, the last few days I've been deep in the Ed Sullivan show, uh, which means I've not only been watching them, but before watching them, I've been looking at all the business paperwork relating to how the Beatles came <coughs> from it, the contracts, the, the, the relationship between them and between Brian and Ed and all of that. It's, um, it's quite interesting stuff. And, and Brian, then, didn't Brian settle for a, a very modest sum, in fact? It, but in exchange for that, th th they could be on two consecutive weeks' shows. Was that right? It was very little they were paid. They were paid, no, they were, they were paid a pretty good fee, not the top fee, but they were paid uh, $10,000 for three shows, plus return uh, airfares for, for the five of them, uh, London, New York, and their Plaza Hotel bill as well. So, in fact, it was a pretty good deal. Uh, you could arguably have got more from Ed, but as from, as from Ed's point of view the Beatles weren't anything in America. So he wasn't going to pay any more than that. If Brian had kept pushing for a higher fee, Abe would have dropped it. But what Brian did insist on, and this was Brian's brilliance, was that they would only be on it if they were top of the bill. They weren't just on the show, they topped the bill. And in those days of hierarchical TV shows, which were based on variety, top of the bill was the all important spot. You didn't just want to be on the show. You had to be, or Brian wanted the, all the Beatles always to be top of the bill. Uh, and that was the deal he struck with Ed, that they would be top of the bill for two shows and um, guest star billing on the third. In the end, they were elevated to joint top of the third as well. So it was a brilliant deal by Brian. And uh, it was a bit of a risk by Ed. The, the, the story that he always told and Brian told as well of uh, Ed being at London Airport and this uh, London Airport is teeming with kids welcoming the Beatles back from Sweden. Uh, and as Ed told it, the Queen of England's plane got held up and the Prime Minister's plane got held up because of all these kids swarming all over the tarmac for the Beatles. That is hugely exaggerated. And in fact, it's in the, in the case of Ed booking the Beatles, completely untrue. It was a made up story at the time that stuck. Uh, and I, I will be showing how it isn't true. So there's always more to them meets the eye. <laughs> Well, we'll look, we'll look forward to that, but we'll Good. have to look quite a long way forward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a thing, if, if people want to know when the next book is out, they should go to my website. I've written a page called Volume 2 that will eventually be altered with a publication date. But for the moment, it's a holding page just to say, that, don't worry, I am working on it. And it is going to come out, but um, it's a big job. It is certainly a it's big indeed. Job. Yeah, and here in lockdown, you know, everyone's saying, oh, you must be getting on with the book now you're in lockdown. Well, no. we're getting on with it anyway, so it doesn't really make much difference. Right, right, right. I'm probably one of the least effective people, except in certain instances in my life, uh, not being unable to visit people. Uh, yeah. Apart from that and a bit of loss of social life, I'm just working exactly as I was, you know. Hard at it. Hard at grindstone working on foot. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, it's been lovely talking away. to you. It's Thank been you. lovely welcoming you to our attic. From... Yes, yes. I've been looking at your attic and your other, your other casts. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Have you played all those records? Uh, yes. Wow. Yeah, I think one time or another I've played all those records. And I he really does album. have, a, I mean, we, we both realised we had a, a, a rare Krabby Appleton album the other day. But Dave not only has the album... He has uh, the second album, and he has two albums by their main <laughs> singer and songwriter who produced two solo albums. So that's, you know, that's dedication that's it. to the cause. That it's is the it, Harvest of Crabby yeah. albums. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Were they on Harvest by any chance? Crabby Alton, no, Electra. Right. I should know that, but I don't. Um, <clears throat> yeah, American group on Electra. Got some nice Electra stories coming up in volume two of my book. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, because I'm telling the whole 60s story now. 
all the other acts, everybody. All the oh, 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 right. Oh, so it's, this is a fat book. <laughs> oh, what's so going to be a big book? Yeah. So you're looking at all their other the main competition as well. Well, you, you sort of have to, don't you? Yeah. Really? You have to. You have to look at the Beatles in context. Yeah. You do. Everybody, you do. Everybody else, with the kind of shows they were doing, the kind of fees they were getting, the managers, the labels, the rise of independent producers. Yeah. The business, the business is evolving. If you look at the business the Beatles entered in '62, to how it is when they bow out in '70s, complete difference. It's a difference that they have absolutely propelled, um, and I need to show it. I need to show that metamorphosis. That's the thing that's throwing me when you when you're talking about the eighth of December business, in 1960 and 1970. You know that that that, that diff, the, the changes in the world. Yes. Between John Lennon throwing that stone up at his at Mimi's window, yeah, and sitting there giving the retrospective "it's all over" interview, yes, to Jan Wenner, ten yes. years later. Now, ten years later from ten years ago from now, takes us to two thousand and ten, which just seems like the day before yesterday. It does. It really does. Mind you, it could be in the context of what we're going through at the moment. It may subsequently seem a lot more distant. Yeah, yeah. I do think the world that we knew that ended a few weeks ago may not come, well, it won't come back in the form that we knew it. No, no. And uh, everything's up in the air now. It's really quite incredible. An existential crisis. I mean, it's, who would have thought? Well, let's get on with the typing, shall we? Yes, yes. Let's get back to, the, back to our work. Thanks for having me. Nice Thank you very much. It's lovely to see you, Mark. Yeah, so yes. don't, yeah, don't forget it. One we'll, of the, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. And you'll get very grateful. Okay. 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 Cheers, Mark. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.